first questions first can you please elaborate on you know what is capturing profound moments that represent the unbalanced world in which we live in i don't know where you got this from i got it from your bio <laughs> Well, you know, basically, um, I'm a photographer and a filmmaker, so, you know, um, 20 years of my life I've been covering issues, mainly in Africa, uh, and the profound moments, I mean, the first war in Darfur, the war in Sierra Leone, Somalia, I think those are uh, wars that have been affecting a lot of people, and I was there for the documented, documenting it. And, yeah, and we'll be talking about profundity, I would speak about motorhead, you know. That was, uh, some people think that was an easy job, an easy task, you know, and it wasn't, you know, following these uh, crazy people during the night and sleeping during the day, it's a hard job too, you know. So, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm a photographer who had the lucky enough to choose the stories I wanted to do, and I, I was always fascinated with Afri Africa, you know, I feel at home there. And, yeah, I spent 20 years documenting African issues. 20 years? Wow. So most of your work is in and around Africa. Yeah, a lot, a lot of it, yeah. Uh, especially in my first years, I was collaborating with MSF, Doctors Without Borders. Uh, I, I cover not only issues uh, of uh, war and post-war, but also human rights issues. I have a long body of work on HIV and AIDS. Actually, I follow the first pills that Doctors Without Borders uh, sent into Africa, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Wow. And Ethiopia, I follow patients uh, on trial, uh, trying the first cocktail pills, the antiretroviral therapy. That was back in 2001. So, that's your current project, right? The HIV and AIDS? That's no, my current project, project is... Um, I just finished it. I'm more focused on films now, documentary films. I also work as director of photography in, in, in cinema productions. But the body of work I'm doing now is about a heavy metal community in Botswana. You know, it started as a group project from Nur. We wanted to highlight a bit of a different story on Africa. It's called New, New, New Light on Africa. And I decided to go to Botswana just to prove that peace can bring freedom and freedom can bring freedom of expression. And Botswana's Hellbangers is a very clear example, you know, that when people have freedom and they can be who they want to be, uh, and a lot of metal heads appear to me. So how different, you know, you spoke about your motorhead experience saying that was a very profound project for you. So how different was the experience, you know, of documenting a rock band? What is it actually to live on the roads with a band, you know, with a bunch of couple of crazy guys? Yeah, well, that was a, a dream come true, you know, since the kid I listened to motorhead and I was uh, collaborating with Rolling Stone magazine. They always would send me to shoot these this issues. That's why that's what we do, cover issues. And once I spoke to Jody Beckman, the picture editor, I said, why don't you send me to follow a rock band? I said, which band do you want to follow? I said, I want to follow Motorhead. I said, well, we have no interest, but we can, you know, we can bridge you in. We can be the, the, maybe the link. So I managed to be with them, and Rolling Stone managed ended up publishing eight pages from Lemmy and the Vampire Science State. All the Rolling Stones around the world managed to publish the same story. And since that day, I was the kind of official photographer of the band. I, I directed their last two official video clips. I did a photo book called Roadkill. I traveled with the band. Um, yeah, it was an amazing experience. I mean, it's, it, it's hard because it's nightlife. Uh, my first 10 days in the band were the hardest because I was following them with a the rental car. So that meant that I had to do like 400, 500 kilometers after the party and be there next day, 3, 3 p.m. for the, for the sound check. So I think these guys must have seen that this is a hardworking guy. He's, he deserves to be with us. After 10 days, they let me return the car to the rental car and brought me in the bus. I thought they were going to bring me in the crew bus, but no, I was invited to go in the band bus with Lenny, Phil and Nicky. And since then, I've been a part of the family. Wow, that, that must have been an experience. Yes, it is, a, it is a, I would say, a dream come true. So your favorite band was Motorhead? It's, it is, it still, still is. Still my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the Faith in Chaos project, that is, you know, the aftermath of a war. Mm -hmm. So generally aftermath of a war, the people are very vulnerable, they're broken, or, you know, they're refugees, they're going through a lot of things. So how do you establish that relationship with your subjects, you know, in such a scenario? Well, basically, uh, 
uh, I when I started working there in 2002, uh, uh, you get the relation with the people and the trust uh, staying long enough, not being a news photographer, caring about the people, talking to the people, uh, explaining them honestly what are you doing there. You know, my story on Vaping Chaos is a, is a body of work that I did in 2002 when I was selected for the Lotus Follow Masterclass. That year's thing was fake, and my story is about the physical and the psychological consequences of the war. So I collaborated with War Child, it's an NGO that was giving uh, psychosocial therapy to children affected by the war. And I work uh, with the amputees in Sierra Leone, the RUF, the Revolutionary United Front, started cutting arms so people could not vote for the opposition. Then they started cutting legs, and then they started cutting heads. So one, of, one day in the refugee camp, in front of the camp in Aberdeen, I saw this guy with a crotch just playing football. I said, what are you doing? He said, man, we started a, a new a, a football team of amputees. I said, well, that's my story. So I followed them for five years. I made a book. I, I pitched the project to also a farm company. I managed to give them $20,000 for their sponsorship. And then, yeah, little by little, I, I became a, a Sierra Leone. I'm, I'm known there. I also collaborated with Dr. Nahim. You know, he was in charge of Kissy Mental Home, where they use, uh, we used to have people, uh, patients chained to the floor with no diagnostics, no medicines, no nurses, no doctors, no human treatment, people lying in their own peace and excrements. Uh, so I work in City of Rest, where they use the Bible as therapy for people affected by the war, people that had to kill their own families, people that had to witness things they should have never witnessed. You know, the psychological part of the war for me was the one that really affected me m most, you know, because the physical are obvious. And even though uh, the physical consequences of the war with these guys that lost their legs and their arms, uh, at the end, you know, you're supposed to be outcasted in Africa, but there are people that now represent their country, they play football internationally, they're called the ambassadors for peace, you know. The players must have one leg and the goalkeepers must have one arm. So these are people that suffered the direct consequences of the war, and now they are representing their country playing football, you know. So it's a positive story in the dark environment. That's what we do at NUC, the foreign agency that I co-founded 11 years ago. We shine the light in the darkest places on earth. That's what I'd like to do. Wow. So as a doc, you know, as a photojournalist who documents, you know, a lot of social issues, what do you think is your social responsibility you know, towards the society? My responsibility towards the society? Well, you know, I'm kind of done with that. You know, I mean, as a young photographer, you start with a lot of hope and a lot of naivety. And you think, I'm going to publish this picture and I'm going to change the world. That's bullshit, you know. You cannot change the world without an active role. You know, you can, if you have an active role and you know who to target, who to bring those photos, who to touch, then you can bring change, you know. But it's very naive to take photos, publish them in any media, and expect people to react, you know. And it's also very difficult to know what have your photo done for the people you have photographed, you know. I would turn the question around, you know, what has society done when they see our work? You know, I think people are very, very, you know, used. They, we have a, a, an overdose of photos and news and drama. And what are people doing? Nothing. Most of people are doing nothing. So, you know, photographers sometimes put point at us with fingers. And I would do the opposite. You know, at least we're trying to do something. We're trying to show you something. We're trying to enlighten you. We take risk for you to be able to see it. What, what can you do? What are you going to do? You know? So, when you're releasing the output or when you're Looking at the output, how do you do justice to the story of work? What is it that you keep in mind while you know executing your work? How do you make sure the story you've heard is being told in the right way? Yeah, very good question. You know, first of all, here it is, you know, don't work with preconceived ideas. I always, I was explaining this today in, in the class, in the master class I'm having with this Indian uh, future good photographers. Don't work with preconceived ideas. Don't use other people's criteria for your own, own story. And don't fucking Google. If you Google the thing, you, you're reading things that other people have ideas about. Go, you know, Google the weather. Do that. And you can, you know, take a shirt or a jacket. You know, but don't Google news. Don't Google 
what the story is about. Go there, talk to people, leave the emotions in order to express them. That's what my photography is about. Leave the emotions. You can you have to take sides, you can be objective. That's for me the no way, no way. You have to be subjective, you have to feel what people are telling you, you have to take sides, you have to defend your own story. When I when I launch a long-term project, you have to become a specialist about it. You cannot just be a, a tourist passing by telling them, you know. My bodies of work are long-term projects. I immerse myself into it. And I don't do the research before I go there. I talk to people on the ground. I, I, I live with the people. I stay long enough that people know me and I know the people. I stay long enough that when it comes that I have to speak about a certain issue in that country and I spend five years that I can speak about it. That's, that's the relation, you know, I like to have with, with photography, that responsibility, you know. And it's not about truth only, because there are many truths. You know, but at least that's one of the truths, the one I've witnessed and the one I live and, you know, and the one I'm hoping that it, it has some truth and some, and some reality, you know. So normally when you go to a different place, usually people have that notion about journalists or something, you know, when you go for a story, nobody wants to be honest. So how do you blend in, how do you present yourself, you know, how do you blend in the crowd? It depends, every story is different. Uh, if I know the country and I know the place, I, I, I make myself heard and seen. If I have to do like uh, the film I did on Bangladesh, on modern slavery, where it was very difficult access, you know, to, you know, trying to interview this girl that had been forced into prostitution for many years, as young as 10 year old, 12 year old, you know, then I, I tried to look for features and people that can interview these girls that are aware and that uh, have an affinity and know what they're talking about, but they know each other from the past. So uh, it, it varies, every, every situation is different. I did a story on on, uh, on migrants escaping the Mugabe regime from Zimbabwe and escaping into South Africa, for example, it was an award-winning film. Um, and I, I found out that the best way to understand the issue was that one of the one of the people that were in the film became my feature because he liked filmmaking and he knew everyone and he knew all the stories and he was sort of you know the guy that presented me all the options, I took them or not, but you know. I, every story is different. You, know, you have to immerse yourself, you know, you have to kind of forget where you are and, and jump into, into the storytelling, you know. And it's a trick in itself, you know. So, I, I come from Nur, and Nur we have a very, very strong uh, code of ethics, you know. We, we, we are very stubborn since the very first day. I think that's why our agency is very well uh, perceived, you know, we, we don't fool, we don't lie, we don't set up, we don't add, we don't take away, you know, we are pure uh, storytellers and, you know, I think that's our advantage, especially nowadays there have been so many compromises and so many people caught in the wars like World Press Forum, you know, fooling, you know, and that's, I think this is really bad for our profession, uh, especially for people outside of the profession, uh, now people start to doubt when they look at photos. And that, for our job, is that is really bad. So, you know, what I want to do is encourage people to, to, to be honest, you know. It's not about sharing reality or being objective. It's about being honest and say how you've done things. Say how you got to those things or to these people, you know. You know, I think honesty is very, very necessary nowadays where, you know, digital photography has become less trusted because of manipulation. Not only like manipulation of the image, but manip manipulation of the scene. You know, why don't you stay there with it? Why don't you die with there? Like weird things, you know, wrong captioning, you know, setting up scenes. I mean, if, there's nothing wrong in, set, in setting up scenes. As long as you say this is a setup scene, and you know, this reality, this is, I do this setup scene because I want to show you how it could be, you know, I mean, sometimes people are not good at documenting, some people are good at creating, and then they should have the, fi the freedom to create too, as artists, you know, not everyone is willing to take risks and document our time, but some people are more creative 
and can bring through creations also a broader view of a certain issue. So it's valid, but don't try to sell me <laughs> a creation as a document. Thank you so much. It was a very nice conversation with you. Thank you.